I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 17 through the remainder of the chapter. Verse 21. I've titled this teaching, Consummated Conversion. We've used the word conversion as an interpretive base, so to speak, to unpack the truths of this third chapter. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, unless you're converted and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so obviously, conversion is of the utmost importance. Jesus is very clear that if a person of this world is to be accepted into the kingdom of heaven, they must be converted. That raises a question. What does conversion mean? I'm glad you asked and give you a succinct answer. In the biblical sense, conversion means simply a turning, a spiritual turning away from sin in repentance and to Christ in faith. Actually, conversion is the backside of the coin of regeneration. If regeneration is pictured like a coin, regeneration, new birth, born again, however you want to title it, if that's one side of the coin, then the other side of the coin is conversion because when regeneration happens, there is going to be a conversion, a turning, a change. There's going to be a, a change of mind, a change of view, a new recognition of who God is, of who you are before God, of what sin is, a better understanding of who Christ is and what claims he makes up on your life. Conversion involves a change of affections. There's a sorrow for sin committed against a holy and just God. It involves a change of will. There's an intentional turning away from sin and turning to God through Christ to seek forgiveness. So we've explored confident conversion. That was the first study in chapter three, which by that I mean being saved and sure of it. And secondly, last week we looked at continuing conversion which is being changed from one degree of Christ-likeness to another throughout our Christian life. And today we're going to look at consummated conversion. So here's the reality. True conversion will take the believer from guilt by grace to glory, from regeneration in our hearts to sanctification, and finally to glorification in new bodies in a new heaven and a new earth. So, True conversion rests confidently on the promise of Philippians 1.6. Look in your Bibles back up in chapter 1 at verse 6. A great verse of scripture. You need to memorize it if you haven't. Philippians 1.6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's a great promise. He who began a good work will finish what he started. So let's unfold this first of all, verse 17, by considering timely words of wisdom about our current conduct. Timely words of wisdom about our current conduct. Verse 17, brothers, join me, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example of, that you have in us. So we're to be imitating those who imitate Christ. This is the New Testament model for disciple making. Uh, and it's in a personal example. It's not just about information transferred. It's a first and foremost about relationships and about the modeling of what it is that that person is to become. And each Christian <clears throat> is expected to supply such an example. So when Paul commands believers to imitate him, it seems rather egotistical, right? Imitate me, but it's not. In fact, you and I should be able to say that. Why is it not? Well, because the truth is, people will either take you as an example of Christ or as an exemption from Christ. You understand what I'm saying when I use that? You, you'll either be an example or they'll use you as an excuse, an exemption for not coming to Christ. So you can't escape the exerting of influence. Anyone 
who has uh, any leadership whatsoever is a person of influence to one degree or another. Dwight L. Moody said, 100 men, of 100 men, one will read the Bible and the other 99 will read the Christian. I don't know about the statistics, but I do know that's true. Over 56 years of being a Christian, 51 years in vocational ministry, I've heard dozens and dozens of times the excuse of why I don't want to become a Christian and it's because of other Christians. That is an excuse, but nevertheless, it shouldn't be one. So everything we say is either a profession of faith and a promotion of faith, or it's a prevention of faith in the lives of other hindrance. Our words and works are either an encouragement in favor of good or of less good or of evil. Nevertheless, we are having an influence. So there are two key words, uh, two key verbs rather, not words, but two key verbs in our text today. One is join in imitating me, and the other, keep your eyes on those who walk contrary to that. And both of them are in the present tense, which denotes continuing action. So for this reason, Paul boldly urged Christians to follow the example of the testimony and technique of other Christians. This means that the following of right examples should be the consistent and continuous activity of every Christian. So, in light of that, a Christian should constantly ask themselves, is my life worth copying? Now, now here's, a, here's a question my mentor Herb Hodges raises. Would I want to live in heaven among a society of Christians who have lived their lives by the impression that I've made on them? Would I want to spend the rest of eternity in a society that kind of looks halfway like me? Well, you say, how can I answer that? Well, here's the answer, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. This is never egotistical, and it never will lead to a cult leader following type of situation if you do what Paul says, and that is in spe uh, specifically spelled out in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Follow me or be imitators of me, and the word is mimitase in the Greek, mimic me, as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's the, that's the qualifier. And if I'm following Christ, you want to follow me. If I'm being like Christ, you want to be like me. I'll be a, a pattern for you. Where I'm not, you don't follow me. So listen again. Someone has and is and will continue to influence you. Probably I've had a greater influence by people dead than people who are alive primarily because I'm a reader and, and, and there are a number of people that have influenced me beyond the grave and continue to do so. And I'm sure that's true of you too. But if you, if you examine Paul's letters in the New Testament, there'll be a common thread throughout and it'll be something like this. First Thessalonians 1, 7. You became an example, a pattern to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. He made the same appeal to the Corinthians that he presents in our text today. I urge you then, be imitators of me, 1 Corinthians 4, 16. And then as I already read, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So he starts out with these timely words of wisdom about our current conduct, and that is find persons that are setting examples and imitate them. Uh, an older uh, person or a, a, certainly a more maturing person. How mature do you have to be to have that kind of influence? How far in front of another person do you have to be? Listen closely, half the step. That's all, this, uh, that's all you have to be, a half a step. If, if, if you are a half a step in front of a person you're wanting to disciple, you already are in front of them. It's not how far you've got to be. We, we oftentimes hesitate about wanting to do this because we're afraid they're going to raise a question we can't answer or we're going to fumble the ball and we're going to mess up. Guess what? That's the kind of person that I want to be around. I don't want to be around a person who's got it all together, who has an answer for every question, a solution for every situation, never seems to have a problem. I want around somebody that every now and then when they hit their finger, they curse a little bit and have to repent. They, they, they get in the flesh every now and then. You, you're smiling. You know how that is. 
I'm sorry. My crown tilted a little bit. Let me put it back on. You're surprised. It's, I might do something like that. I know. Bless your heart. You wouldn't do that, but again. But what I'm saying for me, I, I like a person, red-blooded, just flesh and blood that I can identify with and know that, that even when they fall and do that, they want to repent as quickly as possible and get right and, and, and say, I'm sorry or whatever, and, and not, pre not pretend to have it all together. Amen? Amen. Good. I thought you felt that way. Here's the second big idea. Tearful words of warning about counterfeit converts. Verses 18 and 19 of chapter 3. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Now, this is a heartbreaking uh, statement from Paul. And he's not being uh, engaging in hyperbole. He, he, his heart is breaking for these people. Why? Well, first of all, notice their confession is deceiving. For many whom I have often told you are, are now walking as enemies of the cross. My mentor Herb Hodges observed from verse 18 that this divides all people into either friends or enemies of the cross of Christ. The friends of the cross are those who have caught the spirit of the cross, namely that of self-denial. The enemies of the cross are those who manifest the opposite attitude, namely that of self-indulgence and self-pleasure. And then he makes a typical Herb statement. So the millions of people on earth who are marooned on an I land. You, you, you catch that? On an I land. You see, that's the essence of our problem. It's the big I. That's the essence of sin. S-I-N. Selfish, independent negation of the will of God. Not your will, but mine be done. And so we are... We are marooned on an I land of self-centeredness. Our enemies of the central our enemies of the central principle of the Christian life. The cross is the symbol of redemption in its fullness, the symbol of death to self and sin. And so by their sin or by their self-indulgence, these people are bringing into disrepute the cross and all the spiritual realities that the cross represents. Now, these people are parading as Christians. Uh, I, I think they're probably different from those that we were introduced to in the first part of the chapter. Verse, verse 2 of chapter 3. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. These are called Judaizers. And, and these Judaizers are actually unsaved Jews, identifying with Christians, but nevertheless unsaved Jews. And they constantly hounded Paul because they believed he was depreciating the law of Moses and the Jewish religion. These may be the same people, but I think not. I think these would be more in line with what we call today libertines. You say, I don't know what a libertine is. Well, he's, he's that person who said, if it feels good, do it. Whatever, whatever I want to do, I will do. Um, he's that person that says, Grace has got it all covered, so I can just do whatever I want to, whenever I want to, the way I want to, because grace covers it all. Now, um, so the libertines are, are probably those that he's addressing here, and he does so with a broken heart. He's crying. They profess Christianity, but they're not practicing it. Their lips profess Christ, but their lives deny him. They pretend to be friends of the cross, but their lives in fact, reveal that they are the foes of the cross. But not only, not only is their confession deceiving, that confession meaning their confession of faith, but secondly, their conduct is disgracing. They are enemies of the cross. Notice in verse 18 again, the first part, there are many of them. This is not just an isolated incident. There are many of them. And, and, and I would also add there are many today, just as there were in just as there was in the ancient world. And their presence and their influence and their actions moved Paul to tears. Now, also note that they aren't merely enemies of Christ, but of his cross. 
they, they didn't deny that Jesus was crucified. So what does that mean? That they simply hated and resisted the full implications of what the cross meant. They were offended by the idea of a crucified Messiah. They were offended by the suggestion that they were so sinful that nothing short of death on a cross was necessary to save them. They were offended by a salvation that was all of grace and excluded what they believed was the merit of their own good works. That's what the cross slays. Your own efforts in order to merit favor with God. The cross slam dunks that, stabs it through the heart and says, this is how bad your condition was that you could not possibly ever pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make yourself right with God. It took God's intervention. It took such radical intervention as he had to become a substitutionary victim on the cross for us. And again, that's another uh, aspect of the cross that they deny. And that is that there is, <clears throat> that it was necessary for there to be a, listen to these theological words, I'll explain them, a penal substitutionary atonement. Penal means there's a penalty for sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. death. Eternal death, not just physical death. But there are those today, and there are many, unfortunately, who deny this, and they call it cosmic child abuse. They say this, this represents a vengeful father punishing his innocent son for an offense that he has not even committed. How horrible. Cosmic child abuse. Why? Because Jesus, we declare, took our place, and as the old hymn says, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. But that's, that's being denied in so many circles today. So they're, 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 they're enemies of the cross. And then they espouse a doctrine that's devoted to destruction. And this is because they're selfish idolaters. In, according to the text, who is their God? Themselves. Their what? Themselves. Their belly. Now, th that's metaphorically speaking for the most part. No doubt it was true of some, just like it's true of some of us today, unfortunately. <laughs> the persons described here seem to be of the same group Paul referred to in Romans when he spoke of those who serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. That's Romans 16, 18. These, quote, enemies of the cross were sensual and self-indulgent, disregarding the principle that they who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts, Galatians 5, 24. And they made a God of their belly. So this means that the place which properly belongs to God has been taken by the very lowest part of their nature. To these people, the satisfaction of the physical appetite and indeed their sensual appetites. And let me, let me pause right there and define the word sensual. Normally today when you hear that word, what do you think of? Sex. Sex. But that's not true. It simply means pertaining to the senses. The Greek word used in Jude is shukekos, shukekos, which is the word for soul, solical. It's fleshly. It's, it's solical. It's vertical without, uh, horizontal without reference to the vertical. Sensual, uh, sensual desires and cravings. So, uh, to paraphrase Jesus, their supreme concern is, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we do to fulfill our desires, whatever they might be? One commentator said, commentator said, to them, the table was their altar and appetite was their God. Another said, this is the new idolatry to make the senses and whatever gratifies them our chief delight and our principal reliance. So whatever their bodies crave, they feed. Whatever sinful inclination they feel, they embrace. Whatever immoral hunger their souls may sense, they indulge. When the fleshly appetite cries for satisfaction, they bow down and obey it. So in effect, they worship their own passions and desires and lust. And this makes them sensual, selfish, shameless idolaters. And again in verse 19, they're shameless. Verse 19 says, uh, uh, they glory in their shame. 
Wow. If that's ever been true, it's true now. Glorying in their shame. What he says is they're fixated on the here and now to the exclusion of the eternal and heavenly realities. And as a result, whatever is shameful, whatever is perverse and demonic, they take pride in. The, the, the very wicked and perverse behavior that ought to bring conviction and shame, they promote and praise and proclaim and strut and declare openly, publicly, how proud they are to be actually in rebellion against God's truth that they doesn't even believe exists. It's one thing to sin. We all do that. But it's another thing when, rather than feeling conviction and pursuing repentance, a person elevates and promotes and flaunts their sin and wants others to join them. If you haven't done so, do yourself a favor. If you want to understand the times, read Romans chapter 1, 18 through verse 32 again. Read it and you'll see. In fact, turn there. Let me just read the last part of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, uh, and the last, uh, he, he begins uh, in verse 29 saying they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slanders, haters of God, on and on, disobedient, heartless. But, but verse 32 sums it up. Listen to Romans 1, verse 32. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. In other words, they begin to recruit others to do what, what we're doing, recruiting others to join them in their sins. So they're sensual, selfish, and shameless. But notice their conclusion is destruction. Again, this is in verse 19. He says, that uh, their, their end is destruction. Now, this statement clearly tells us that Paul viewed them as only professing believers. Uh, they're not born again. They will ultimately suffer eternal condemnation. But just a note here, it's not annihilation, but ruination, complete loss. It's the forever of experiencing the torments of desire, greed, lust, hate, without one drop of relief or gratification or satisfaction. Now, that's negative. That's, that's horrible. But it's true and never been more true than now. But we don't close on that note. Notice number three, tremendous words of wonder about consummated conversion. Tremendous words of wonder about consummated concluding conversion. Verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. The King James says our vile body. That's an unfortunate translation, in my opinion, because it literally means the body of our humiliation. He will transform the body of our humiliation to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Wow, what a verse. That's an incredible verse. Notice, first of all, the contrast between the this-worldly and the other-worldly citizens. The King James translate that, word, translate that word citizenship, conversation. A number of other uh, translations use homeland, commonwealth. ESV uses citizenship. I think that's the, probably the richest, uh, most... Uh, clarifying exact word. The Greek word is polituma, and from it we get such words as politics, politicians, policemen. Uh, probably the most basic meaning is in our English word citizenship. So we could paraphrase verse 20 to get a fuller idea of his meaning as something like this. We, that is we Christians, have our home in heaven, and here on earth we are a colony of heaven's citizens so that you don't have to go to heaven to get a glimpse of what heaven should be like. Whoa, that's a big challenge. 
after all, that's what a colony was. So when we say that we are a colony of heaven on earth, uh, Paul's taking his frame of reference from the fact that Philippi was a Roman colony. And a Roman colony was simply an outpost, an extension, a small reproduction of the imperial city of Rome. So it was a little bit of Rome away from Rome. And, and so we're, we're to be a colony of heaven and, and, and to be modeling the future city in the present situation and circumstances. So look again in your Bibles as I'm making these statements to this paragraph. At verses 18 through 21, just follow down, just casually following over those, looking over those verses. And notice how stunning the contrast are. The, quote, this worldly citizens are enemies of the cross. What's their destiny? Destruction. Destruction. The other worldly citizens find their joy in the cross, and their destiny is final deliverance from all that sin has tainted. <laughs> They're devoted to indulging the other, the, the, this worldly are devoted to indulging the body and making a God of its appetites. But believers look forward to the transformation of the body by their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The citizens, their citizenship is exclusively this worldly. Ours, ours is primarily otherworldly. They set their sights very, very low and focus only on earthly things. We set our sights very, very high and look expectantly to the heavens for the return of the Lord. Now, my favorite part, verse 21. He will transform our body of humiliation, our lowly body, to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now, the older I get and the closer I get to that final appointment, that all of us have if Jesus dares. The, the more uh, I age, the less I want to look at my aging body. I've told you before, I remember those times when I used to prance through the room in front of the mirror and, and model this physique. And now I just turn my eyes the other way because what was up here has now come down here. And... <laughs> <laughs> what doesn't hurt doesn't work. And, uh -uh. <laughs> I mean, getting old is not for sissies. I, I mean, would you older folks testify to that? I, I mean, I mean, it takes a real man, a real woman to get old. <laughs> you young people can't appreciate that, but just hang on and hold out if Jesus tears. But, but we get all kind of questions of it. Okay, okay. So we're going to be a resurrected body, yes. Well, what about, okay, I had... Uh, my loved one cremated or, or my loved one was lost uh, in a battle at sea. And when they got lost at sea, they probably were eaten by Charlie the Tuna and Charlie the Tuna got caught in a net and eventually went to the cannery and Charlie the Tuna was then eaten by dozens of people all over the world. And that DNA of me, is, of my relative is in all those people. What happens then? Not a problem because the Holy Spirit has the DNA. He has all all that's necessary in order to recreate a body. So listen again. Jesus will take your decomposed, cremated, sunk at sea, eaten by fish body, and resurrect it. Reconfigure it and make it like his glorified body. A body no longer subject to sickness and death. No longer disabled or frail or mentally ill or addicted or weary or tempting or, temp or, or tempted but rather one like unto his glorious body. In 1 John 3, 2 and Romans 8, 23, there are two germane and glorious promises found. Listen to this one. Beloved, we're God's children now, and what, we'll, what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. The second one, Romans 8, 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, listen, the redemption of our bodies. What God started in my spirit, he's going to finish in my body. We're not going to be disembodied uh, Casper the friendly ghost type 
creatures floating around eternity on clouds playing arts. I'm not interested in that. And that's not what it's about anyway. So th these verses, again, reveal what we started out with in uh, Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will not stop until he makes you like Jesus in body and soul. Uh, Pastor John Piper cautions us about two things. Number one, don't over-spiritualize this or under-spiritualize it. And then he goes on and says, you would under-spiritualize it if you thought it could be explained merely in the categories of physical, material reality that you experience now. In other words, it's not identical to what we now have. The body to come is not identical. It's, 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 it's recognizable, but it's not identical. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It is sown a natural body, sown in the grave. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. What does that mean? I don't know. But it'll be good. Just count on it. It'll be perfectly suited to bear the weight of the glory of, perf uh, of perfect spiritual souls. But you would over-spiritualize if you thought you couldn't eat fish. Now, some of you, that wouldn't be good. But, but you could eat or be recognized by your friends after the re uh, re resurrection. Jesus was recognized in his resurrection body by his disciples, Luke 24, 31. And then he said in Luke 24, 39 through 43, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy, <laughs> That's a great statement. They, they, it was just too good to be true. And were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate before them. Now, with my twisted mind, that just raises all kind of questions. <laughs> I'll just keep them to myself. But, but anyway, so, uh, and that's what you and, I, you and I'll do. If you belong to Christ by trusting him, he'll give you a new spiritual body and you'll be recognized by your friends. You'll eat and drink with him in the kingdom of God, Matthew 26, 29. <laughs> Marvel, therefore, that Christ will use his infinite authority and power to raise you and I up from the dead and give us a body like his. <laughs> My friend Sam Storm sums it up for us as he writes, in this life, it's often hard to be happy when you hurt. In heaven with new and glorified bodies, there'll be no fatigue, pain, discomfort, chronic aches or itches. There will be only pure physical pleasure with no bodily obstacles to diminish our ability to see and feel and hear and touch and taste and smell the glories of paradise. Now on earth, physical pleasure often competes with spiritual happiness, but in heaven they're one. The physical and emotional and intellectual pleasures of heaven will infinitely exceed the most ecstatic of physical and sensual pleasures on earth. In the age to come, there will be new faculties of mind to think and to comprehend the majesty of God. There will be new senses that will enable us to see and feel and hear and taste the limitless beauty and sweetness of all that Jesus Christ is. There will be no bodily lust to defile your heart, no physical fatigue to cloud your mind, no wicked impulses against which you must fight, no dullness of spirit to hold you back, no lethargy of soul to slow you down, no weakness of will to keep you in bondage, no lack of energy to love someone else, no absence of passion to pursue what is holy. Sign me up. Insofar as our bodies will be glorified in heaven and thus delivered of weakness and frailty and obscurity and our senses all heightened and magnified and their capacity to see and touch and feel and hear and smell greatly increased and no longer hindered by disease, distraction, our experience will be indescribably joyful. A life lived for Jesus is the only life worth living. Amen. There will be a resurrection day, a reunion day, a reward day. They will come to all of God's people. So the challenge is, may we be found faithful to the end. Now we have resurrection life as Christians in a dying body. Then we will have 
resurrection life in a resurrected, glorified body in the new heavens and the new earth. Until then, resurrection power can fill you this hour, enabling you to be a victor over circumstances and not a victim. Enjoying the trip and not just enduring the troubles with the confidence that the best is always ahead for the child of God. Good things are ahead. Look at this old body. Some of you may never see it again, but if not, the next time you see it, you'll recognize it, but you'll say, my, my, what a handsome dude you really are. <laughs> and I'll say the same thing about you. So that is the challenge that we begin to demonstrate now. Unlike those who have no hope, that we have this confident expectation and anticipation combined with desire that as he is, we one day shall be in glorified bodies, able to do incredible things. For example, and I'm finished, I think one of the abilities is the ability to travel fast, faster than you can imagine. I think one day we'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. Think. I'm on the moon right now. You say, that's ridiculous. Go ahead. You can't prove it. And when we get there and do it, I'll say, yanny, yanny, yanny. <laughs> <laughs> Amen.